within the act of forgiveness lies an extraordinary power. It is the power to right wrongs, heal wounds, and ultimately change the course of history. It is a call to show grace and mercy, not merely as a social recommendation or personal disposition, but as a mandate from the God who forgave us first. Out of love, He chose to take all of our personal garbage and sweep it away, erasing it from our past. In exchange, we have received a clean slate, a brilliant future filled with opportunities to pass this gift on to each other. Through the love of Christ, we too have the power to overlook offenses, right wrongs, and heal history. We too have the power to sweep it all into a big pile of garbage and watch it burn away. Because of the one who showed mercy on us first, we too have the power of forgiveness. Well, today we're going to finish our series on powerful words. And we have spent quite a few weeks on this series, and we're circling back to God's voice and God's words to you this morning. We talked a couple of weeks ago about God's love for you and how He loves you. And then last week we talked about the tongue and how it's like this fire and how it finds some self-control with our tongue. And today we're going to come back to some words that God has for us. Because just like He loves us, if we understand His forgiveness, then it allows us to speak words of forgiveness. And I think one of the things that this world needs to hear after the fact that God loves them is this concept, this idea, and these words of forgiveness. Because the world is broken, because it's hurting, because there's lots of tension, there's lots of turmoil, and there's lots of room and need for forgiveness. And forgiveness is hard, isn't it? It's hard for a whole bunch of different reasons. It's hard to give it because sometimes, maybe the things that have gone on in our lives, and the people that have wronged us, they don't deserve forgiveness. If you've been through some experiences in life where you've been betrayed or you've been hurt, and really if you peel away the layers from a human perspective, those people don't deserve your forgiveness. Because you did nothing wrong to them for what they did to you. It's hard sometimes even just to utter the words, I forgive you. Because maybe we've never had those words ever said to us. Maybe to receive forgiveness like God offers us is difficult because we know who we are. We know what we've done. We know what we think. And so when we hear the words we're going to read this morning about God forgiving us, for many of us, forget trying to forgive other people, but we can't even forgive ourselves or accept God's forgiveness. Because maybe we think the things that we have done are too difficult for God to forgive, or we're too embarrassed, or we're full of shame. Because forgiveness involves humility, it involves the ability to say, you know what, I've actually done something wrong here, and so when we're confessing to God and we're accepting His forgiveness, part of the forgiveness formula is to recognize that we've done something wrong, and for some of us, sometimes that's really difficult just to recognize that we've done anything wrong. And so that makes forgiveness difficult. And then it makes it difficult to show other people forgiveness because if we don't understand what we've been forgiven, then how do we forgive others? And so this morning I want to read a passage of scripture that's kind of, it's, the, it's an Easter passage. And if you'd like to follow along, it's going to be on the screen or you can follow along in your Bibles. I'm going to read from Luke chapter 23 and verse 26 and following. And the reason why I'm going to read this this morning is because a person's last words sometimes can be the most... Like, powerful, right? Like, if you knew you were going to die, and you knew you only had a few words left and a few moments left to say them, what would you say? And so Jesus is on the cross, as we're going to read this morning, and Jesus has only a few things to say. And this is what he says. Verse 26 and following. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was put... <clears throat> Excuse me. who was on his way in from the country and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people 
followed him, including women who mourned him and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs who never bore, the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and the hills cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, which is a symbol of Jesus being there, what will happen when it's dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, where they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left, Jesus said. So his minutes are numbered. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered, and they said, He saved others, let him save himself, if he's the God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you're the king of Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. There's a confession. And then he says to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, these are his nearest final words, Truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. And essentially what Jesus is saying to that man, is you forgive him. And so the last couple of statements, there's one more when Jesus commits his spirit into God's hand. But the last couple of statements that Jesus says before he dies on the cross, according to Luke, are about forgiveness. And so when you are confronted with Jesus, when you understand what the gospel says, when you hear these words, what does it do to you? How does it make you feel? How does it make you think? What are the ideas that go through your head? What does this mean to receive forgiveness? What does it mean that God forgives you and forgives me? In Psalm chapter 32, verse 1 in the Old Testament, it said, Blessed are those who are the one whose transgressions, whose sin, whose evil, whose thought patterns, however you want to define transgression as the negative things that separate us from God, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. God, the Father, and the Son are in the business of forgiving you and me because He wants this relationship. He wants to forgive us. And so why is this such a big deal? Why is this important? What does this mean for you and I? So let's just quickly pull up the, the curtain just a little bit. I just want to bring out a couple of points before we figure out how we apply this to our lives. And the first principle that comes out of this passage for me this morning is that this heals our vertical relationship. Forgiveness heals our vertical relationship. Now we know we've heard about it, you've heard me preach about it before, and if you read through the scriptures you know about it, but this is a reminder that this is a big deal. This is the deal. Because this is the deal that allows us to pass from this life into the next life, to be with Jesus, to be forgiven, to have our sins gone, wiped clean, so that we can stand in the very presence of God. It heals our vertical relationship with God that's broken because of our sin that's in our lives. Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And then when the... Criminal who's hanging on the cross knows who Jesus is and confesses his sin and says, I deserve this, but you don't. Jesus forgives him and his vertical relationship with Jesus and God is all of a sudden made good. There's a farmer who had a sheep and a pig and they escaped one day. Together they had found a weak railing in the fence and had uh, figured out how to break it and dig underneath it and escape using their weight. See their opportunity, they quickly bolted from the field once they got out from the fence and began to explore their new and unfamiliar surroundings. It didn't take long for the farmer to notice that two of his animals were missing and to set out to find them, but the animals had wandered far and not much of a trail had been left. Days soon turned into night and uh, the farmer had to go home because he couldn't find them. 
He resumed his search in the morning. The animals had been gone now for more than 24 hours and, began, and he began to wonder what could possibly have happened to them. It was the afternoon of the second day that he began to hear a distant bleating, the sound of a sheep crying out. He then began to follow the sound as it led toward a nearby bog. And it was there that he found the missing sheep and the missing pig. Both had fallen into a deep ditch. Both had become coated in muck. Both were unable to scramble out and to rescue themselves. But where the pig was content to wall around in the mud, the sheep had begun to beat bleat pathetically until the farmer had come to rescue it, to lift it out, and to cleanse it and clean it. Then said the farmer, if you've ever deceived, if you've if you are ever deceived into sin by overtaken or being overtaken by weakness, don't lose heart. Go at once to your compassionate Savior. Tell him the simplest words of the story of your fall and the sorrow you feel. Ask him to wish you at once and to restore your soul. For if a sheep and sow pig fall into a ditch, the sow or the pig wallows in it. But the sheep bleeds pathetically until he or she is cleaned by their master. Be the sheep, my friend, and not the pig. It's a very simple metaphor and story. But it's so true. It heals our vertical relationship between us and God because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross when He forgives us. And so when we hear the words, you are forgiven, this should mean everything to us. We, we sing it in our songs. We talk about it in prayer. and We talk about it as Christians in our faith. And it's part of our lingo. It's part of our language. But it is literally everything for us. Because we've been forgiven. And the result of that forgiveness is that just like the criminal who's hanging on the cross, he's going to get to spend an eternity with Jesus because he confessed it. Because Jesus forgives him. This world and this around us in history are full of all kinds of prelude and foretaste of disaster. There's sunrises and sunsets and symphonies and rock concerts and feasts and friendships. But all of those, all of them, all of the good experiences, all the bad experiences are just but a whisper. They're a prologue to something that a grander story, a bigger picture, a longer future, an eternity. One that once we are there will never end. J.I. Packard said it so well. Hearts on earth say in the course of a joyful experience, I don't want it to ever end. But it inevitably ends. You ever had one of those days where you just don't want it to end? But hearts in heaven say, I want this to go on forever and for it to never end. And guess what? It'll never end. It will be an eternity with Jesus. And whatever that looks like, whatever the experience is going to be, it's going to be the very best thing that God has in plan and has in store for you and for me. Because you're forgiven. It's so simple. It's so profound because it heals our vertical relationship. But not only does it heal our vertical relationship, it heals us. It sets us free from condemnation. I love this passage of Scripture. It's one of my favorite. We've read it before, but I'll just read through it really quick again. In John chapter 8, and it's the parable of the woman caught in adultery. And I love the words that Jesus tells this woman at the end of the story. And in John chapter 8, if you'd like to follow along, verses 1 to 11, I don't have it on the screen. But they all went home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and sat down there to teach him. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Now, Jesus could have had a legal conversation. He could have said, well, yeah, but where's the man? He could have had a whole conversation and, 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 and wiggled his way out of this and, and very easily crushed the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But you know the story, he doesn't. Jesus bends down on the ground and he starts writing with his finger. When they kept questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any of you 
Who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her? Again, he stooped down and he began to write on the ground. At, those, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. You see, what, free, what forgiveness does is it sets us free. And when you've been forgiven from sin, from an addiction, from mistakes that you've made, not only does it heal our vertical relationship with God, but it heals us. It heals our heart. There's therefore, in Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, there's therefore no more condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. No more shame. No more condemnation. Condemnation by definition is a strong censure, a disapprobation, a reproof. Well, that didn't really help me much. College Dictionary says, it's the act of saying that something or someone is very bad or unacceptable. I like that better. That makes sense to me. So when you're condemned, you're not acceptable. When you're condemned, there's something bad. There's sin. There's filth in our lives and our minds. And that makes us condemned. But what forgiveness does is it says that there's no more condemnation. It sets us free from that condemnation. It sets us free from the state of being unacceptable. And now we are acceptable before God and we are set free from the sin that destroys our life. So not only does forgiveness heal our vertical relationship, but it also heals us. Our humanity, our hearts, our minds. And this is important. Because it's one thing to have your relationship with God, your vertical relationship, restored and healed. It's another thing to have our hearts and our souls healed and to be set free and to understand that we have no more condemnation, that God now loves us, that He has a relationship with us. But then the third thing that happens with forgiveness, and this is where the rubber hits the road and where sometimes we feel like we're banging our heads up against the wall or whether we're down on the ground and we just don't, we don't want to get back up. This is just too difficult. This is too hard. Is that forgiveness heals our horizontal relationships. So forgiveness heals the vertical between us and God. It heals us. And this is where living out our faith comes to play, is it also heals our horizontal relationships. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, Jesus said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. To a paralyzed man, to Luke chapter 5, verse 20, Jesus says to them, because of your faith, your sins are forgiven. In Luke chapter 7, verse 48, then Jesus says to her, your sins are forgiven. This is the woman who anoints Jesus, who anoints Jesus with her tears and her perfumes. Jesus is in the business of forgiving us. And then, he asks us to forgive. You see, Peter comes to him at one point, in Matthew chapter 18, and he says to Jesus, Hey, Jesus, you know, I want to know something. How many times am I supposed to forgive my brother, my sister? Is it just seven times? You want to follow along and read from Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and following. Then Peter came to Jesus and said, How many times should I forgive my brother or sister's sins against me? Up to seven times? Peter thought, That's a lot. Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven. And there's a lot of debate about what that means, but it basically just means a lot. And then he tells a parable. And this is the horizontal relationships. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began to set a settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold, that's a lot of money, was brought to him. Since he was unable to pay or not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Now that's harsh. At least it sounds harsh to us. But in this day, this is what happened. You were the bankers. The bankers didn't just take your stuff. They took you and your family and your kids who could sell you into slavery. 
And so instantly this man has lost everything. At that, the servant fell to his knees before him and said, Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. This is an example of forgiveness. This man owed him everything, and the master said, Okay, you're forgiven. Debt is cleared. That's the vertical relationship. That's the horror. The, 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 I'm, I'm healed. I'm, I'm free. I'm, I'm, my debts have been cleared. But then listen to this. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, which is nothing compared to all the gold he owed. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay me back what you owe me, he declared. This guy's missed something. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged, and rightly so, and went back and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant. He said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. That last sentence is pretty strong. It's pretty tough. You see, for many of us, it's hard to receive God's forgiveness and it's hard to get that vertical relationship right and it's hard to receive the forgiveness and accept the freedom and the no condemnation to release ourselves from the habits of the past and the mistakes we've made. That can be tough. It can be difficult. But then we read something like this and Jesus says, you know, because I've forgiven you, you need to forgive others. But they did this. They said that. They took this. They robbed me of that. And there are some very difficult stories and experiences in life that some of us have gone through that really do beg the question, God, do you really expect me to forgive that person for what they did to me, to my family, to my loved ones? But Scripture is very clear about this. That yes, this is why Jesus came to forgive us. Because this is the greatest example of love, is to lay down your life to forgive others even when they don't deserve it. Now that doesn't mean that we have to live in relationship with them on a regular basis and bend over backwards and let people take advantage of us. But it does mean that when we have been wrong, when things have gone wrong in life and somebody has wronged us, that we are called to lay down our lives and to forgive them, which means not hold it against them, which means not to condemn them consistently or constantly, to not make them unacceptable or to make them a bad person, but to forgive them the way that Jesus has forgiven us. When the first missionaries came to Alberta, Canada, they were savagely opposed by a young chief of the Cree Indians named Maneska Putun. I hope I pronounced that right. But he responded eventually to the gospel and accepted Jesus Christ. And shortly after he became a Christian, a member of the Blackfoot tribe, which was another native tribe, killed his father. Maska Platoon rode into the village where the murderer lived and demanded that he be brought before him. Confronting the guilty man said, You have killed my father. Listen to this. So now you must be my father. You shall ride my best horse and wear my best clothes. In utter amazement and remorse, his enemy exclaimed, My son, now you have killed me. And he meant, of course, that the hate in his own heart had been completely erased by the forgiveness and kindness of the Indian chief, or native chief, whatever's the political way to say it. But what an example of forgiveness. And there are many people in our lives that probably need our forgiveness. And sometimes they're the small things, and, and sometimes they are the huge things. The wounds that gather and are so deep in our lives. 
The people that have rejected us, have turned their backs on us, and the people that have outrightly gone to destroy our lives or our character. Sometimes intentionally and sometimes even not intentionally. But hear the words of Jesus this morning first. You're forgiven. And somehow come to terms with that acknowledgement that you know that I didn't deserve this forgiveness. I didn't deserve the, the, the forgiveness that Jesus came when he died on a cross. I'm like that thief. I hung on a cross and I should be hanging on a cross for the things that I have done wrong. I think sometimes the problem that we have is that maybe we don't think we're really that bad. That maybe we really don't think, hey, I, you know, I haven't done anything that deserves to be hung on a cross. I, I'm not as bad as, and you fill in the blank of somebody else who you think is worse than you. And we measure ourselves. And Jesus says that not anything you do that's against God, any sin, any thought that you have, the end result of that is separation from God, is eternity from Him. And so no matter how bad you think it is, or how good you think it is, anything that separates you from God is what makes us, makes you require forgiveness for him, from Him. And when we begin to understand it, and when we begin to understand what God has rescued us from, that He has healed our vertical relationship, that He has healed our hearts, only then can we offer forgiveness. One of the difficulties that I had with Nezumim, which is where we spent two years of our lives last year, was this organization's sole goal was to try and bring relationships and people from Arabs and Jewish people together and try and get them to understand each other and to forgive each other because there's a long history. But the problem is, you cannot bring an Arab and a Jew in a room together and expect them to forgive each other if they've never experienced forgiveness themselves. Because the wounds are too deep. The history is too deep. And the only faith, the only God that loved us so much and loves His people and the Arabs and people all over the world and was willing to come and die on a cross to forgive you and to forgive me is Jesus. And every healing, every reconciliation, every relationship that needs to be mended and brought back together, the only way it works, the only way forgiveness happens is when both of those individuals know Jesus Christ and have received His forgiveness. Then, true healing can begin to happen. And when there's two people in conflict and two people groups that have hurt each other and one person has a relationship with Jesus and their vertical relationship is forgiven and healed and they are healed, they can offer forgiveness. And forgiveness can be given, but at that point only is an example of Jesus' love and grace and compassion through you and through me. But until the other person receives Jesus' forgiveness, they're just going to think, you're nuts, and you're crazy, and they're not going to understand it, and that's okay. Because when people don't understand something, they can do one of two things. They can lash out and get more angry and do more things to require forgiveness. Or they can say, why would you forgive me? Why would you do that? And it's at that point we can say, because Jesus forgave me. Many times that's all that needs to be said. Because I have been forgiven. I am willing to forgive because of what Jesus has done for me. And so these are the final words of our series, powerful words. Jesus says to you and he says to me, you're forgiven. There's two questions that help us apply these words to our lives. And the first one is, have you received his forgiveness? Because if you can conceptually there, yeah, I get it, you went to a cross, and down at a cross, been in church a long time, or maybe you're checking this out for the first time online, and you understand, okay, yeah, I get it, I get it. But it's one thing to get it, and it's another thing to say, you know what? 
I accept it. I've done this wrong. I've said this. I've thought this. Yeah, you know what? I am separated from God. I have done things wrong and that deems me unacceptable. It deems me condemned. But Jesus, just like the guy on the cross, I'm going to confess who you are. I'm going to acknowledge that I deserve what's coming to me. I'm going to ask for your forgiveness. And Jesus will forgive. Have you received his forgiveness? And the second, which sometimes is even more difficult to live out, is are you willing to give forgiveness? No strings attached. No words of condemnation. No words of judgment, but the simple, are you willing to forgive? When somebody asks, are you willing to forgive when somebody wrongs you? Sometimes even in just silence between you and God to say, you know what, I forgive that person because you've forgiven me. You're forgiven. The very words of Jesus Christ. Have you received forgiveness? And are you willing to give forgiveness? Let's pray. Maybe you're listening online and God's just stirring something in your heart or you're here this morning. And conceptually, you know this idea of being forgiven. You know that you've done things wrong. You know that if you were to stand before God, you would be condemned. You would be unacceptable. So the question is, will you be willing to receive Jesus' forgiveness? Will you be willing to ask Him to forgive you for the wrongs that you have done in your heart and your life? And sometimes that's just to start the relationship with Jesus and He's going to come into your heart and your life and you become a new creation. But for many of us, it's just the everyday life of living as a follower of Jesus Christ because we're not perfect and we're just working and trying to become better. But we need to say, Jesus, would you forgive me again today? Forgive me and receive that forgiveness. Maybe there's a person or people or a people group in your life that you've written off because of what they've done, because of what they stand for, because of what they've said. I just can't go. Jesus says, I've forgiven you so you can forgive them. And as you forgive, your heart will be healed. You'll be set free. You'll be acceptable. You'll be my child and my daughter. And you will be the light and the salt the world needs to see and taste so desperately. Jesus, we give you thanks. We thank you for your forgiveness. We worship you because of your forgiveness. We thank you that you expressed yourself in your words and told us we are forgiven. For these things we pray in your name, Jesus.